We are live in two seconds. Okay. Okay, that was just in time. You are actually a Japanese now. Well, I think I was <laughs> trying to handle something else. <laughs> Well, this 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 is the time of just in case, not just in time. <laughs> All right, guys, we are live. So, hello, everyone. Uh, on the dot of four, we've kept up to tradition. So, thank you so much to all the viewers uh, for being here with us. Um, um, a big thanks to all the panelists for taking precious time on a lovely Saturday. Um, and and we, I want to start this with a quick uh, highlight from the last two fantastic sessions we had. It'll take three minutes and then we're going to jump right in. So thanks everyone and let's start this with uh, highlights. I have never seen a situation that I'm seeing today. I don't think when I uh, worked on the hospital, named it after my father, and I built it, never did I expect a kind of a war zone that I'm seeing today. I, I think at this particular point in time, one has to accept the fact that COVID is here to stay. It's 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 not a, you know a sprint. It's a marathon. <sighs> Basically, uh, if you have fear, you cannot work. I don't think so. I have, I, with fear, I cannot get into the ICU. We are living in an age where knowledge is commodity. And you can just almost Google everything that you want to know. But uh, having this as an opportunity to think outside of your box. Parents need to understand uh, screen time can be essential and non-essential. Now, if you read the WHO guidelines, it says that 60 minutes of a video chat with a parent or a trusted caregiver is not harmful for children. Having a routine is very, very important, you know. Your child needs to be going to bed at right about the same time every day and waking up at the same time every day. So my honest, earnest request to parents is to please not treat this like a vacation. You know, it's not a holiday for any of us. I definitely see a, a blended learning model, which is going to be the future, which is going to be actually practiced uh, more seamlessly. And the classroom time is definitely going to be used more for experiential learning. Kindness has been found to improve your immunity. So my dear friends for watching, write good things on WhatsApp, write good things on FB, don't write very negative, hateful things, write positive things and that will really help you to improve your immunity. The new change and the new challenge that's going to happen to us is the health and hygiene. That is going to be looked into very, very minutely because parents will not send their children unless we are very, very, you know, reassuring that we are taking care of their health, the hygiene. In my whole lifetime, I've seen at least seven major disruptions taking place. And hence, we always know that uh, bad times follow good times and good times follow bad times. If you don't plan for the future and start thinking about it, the future will not come to you. Take care of the present beyond imagination because you got to live to see the next day. So that was it. That was our earlier speakers in the panel. And I welcome absolutely wholeheartedly today's speakers. A quick introduction um, to, the, to the conversation which is about economy, business and livelihood. We meet in very grim times where all the reports and the stats and the data indicates a very long winded road and we don't know when the exact turn will happen. We've seen and endured a lot in these four months, some more than the others. And we, as we open up to see some pent up, pent up demand recovering, we still know there's a lot to be understood. And the widespread supply and demand shock, not at the national level alone, but global level has kind of been unprecedented. But as they say, good leaders are able to inspire even in times of adversity. And that's what we shall set out to do in these next 70, 80 odd minutes. We look ahead and in this forum, we look towards insights, experiences, stories of hope, and maybe some advice, perspective, help, and, and that's our endeavor. So hello and welcome to everyone. I'm gonna quickly introduce all the stalwarts who actually need no introduction. And then we're gonna go into a few rounds of you know, questions that have been framed, hearing and listening from so many speakers, uh, so many audience who have been you know, very, 
um, patiently uh, looking forward to this session. So I'm going to start with Mr. D.K. Joshi. He's the chief economist at Crystal. He leads the economic research agenda. He's a primary spokesperson for Crystal on macroeconomic issues. He addresses our government periodically on matters of economic interest. And as a macroeconomist, he is the best equipped to help us see the big picture in these times that matters to each of us, each decision and each micro decision at every level. So hi, TK, welcome. Yeah, hi, thank, thank, good to be here. Thank you. Next, we have Manish. Hi, Manish. He's the MD and CEO of Magma Housing Finance and SME Business, a noted opinion maker in the MSME space and comes with more than almost three decades of experience in the sector. He's an eminent member of key panels of both SBI and RBI, uh, sorry, SEBI and um, RBI. Um, the MSME, the micro, small, and um, medium scale enterprises are the pulse of the nation. And you, Manish, understand this better than anyone else. We look to you for your insights, for all the entrepreneur people, uh, friends who, who watch us, who, who look at this uh, show and uh, run um, these kind of enterprises. So welcome. Thank you very much. Riaz, again, uh, uh, one of the most popular guys uh, on the panel, the man who reinvented and reshaped the re restaurant industry a few decades back, the CEO of Impresario that spans over several f &B concepts, of course, uh, more popularly known as a guy who got mocha in our lives, and now Social, Slink and Bardo, Smokehouse Delhi, Flea Bazaar, and most recently, Ishara. You've been on our channel before uh, on a very auspicious day, and we look forward to getting back to those kind of reasons to meet. But uh, Riaz, most of all, we look to your insights for how we can pivot around and how entrepreneurs can pivot around the situation. And I really am too. Um, so oh. yeah, so much uh, the head of marketing for personal care division of leading FMCG giant Godrej. She's been with the company for over 17 years and manages everything from new product development to the entire communication development across all media. She's been a popular woman business leader and is a force to reckon with in the marketing industry. So um, welcome, um, Soma. Rachel, uh, Rachel Goenka, she's uh, one of my favorite people here. She owns uh, the chocolate, um, uh, sorry, mm. chocolate, chocolate spoon. spoon. Actually, Sassy Spoon, House of Mandarin, and more than 15 restaurants across Pune and Mumbai. Um, she's uh, somebody who's taken food uh, and her passion in sustainability and uh, you know, um, a, an interesting twist around food to the next level. And Rachel, I really look to you for providing all of us with some fantastic insights. Thanks. So thanks to you, all of you. I'm going to start with an open up um, with uh, the panel and to DK. DK, how uh, has your journey been in the last four months? Well, Just I think. Uh, the, yeah. so, uh, sorry, uh, you want to complete? Yeah, so I just want the first question to all the panelists as to what has your journey been? I want the audience to get to know a little bit about you guys. Well, I think it's been a massive learning experience. And I think what we thought uh, in, the, in the month of January when the pandemic hit China was very different from what uh, perception we have today. I think, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's number one. I think the number of surprises, the number of downward revisions in GDP I think I haven't seen them uh, anywhere in my career. And also the pleasure of, uh, I, I always thought that it's it's good to work from home. And I think that has its own pleasures. And I'm also now realizing that it's, uh, it's, it's not pleasure all the way. Too much of everything is bad. And so I think uh, I'm looking for some balance, I mean, for, for normalcy to restore now. Uh, but otherwise, I think it's been a huge learning experience and also an humbling experience. I mean, it's typically said that the economists are there to make uh, weather forecasters look good, but I think uh, the the, uh, the 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 point is that uh, that everybody, including the epidemiologist, everybody is going wrong in this uh, in this crisis so far. So it's such a such a fast moving development. I think uh, it's 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 a great learning experience in some sense. How we need to be prepared going ahead. Thank you, DK. Um, moving to Manish. So, uh, Palvi, I think uh, we all are actually battling a situation which we have never seen in a lifetime. Uh, perhaps I would say that uh, if we battle it well enough, we can say we are the fortunate ones who have seen this once in a century kind of an event. And there are no past precedents or any guidances or recourses for us to find patterns on how we can solve this problem. 
um so it is going to be extremely important on how we collectively figure the way out over last 3 to 4 months as dk very rightly mentioned i think uh, uh, almost everybody has nearly perfected the art of working from home the kids are studying online bald men are getting ponytails and <laughs> and i also believe that uh, this is the time where uh, if most of us believe that the world is going back to the past and and uh, we will be seeing uh, the situation uh, rewinding back to what what was in feb or what was in mars uh, i feel that it could be actually a mirage we are chasing and for all we know that the times we are in right now at least from a year or two year perspective this could be the new normal so i think it is time to reset ourselves to the new normal and reinvent ourselves thank you fair point riaz um well what can i say uh it's it's been uh, you know we, nobody really ever imagined uh that this kind of outcome would occur um it's 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 it sounds like um, uh you know a kind of a very scary episode of black mirror and uh black swan coming together and creating this this phenomena and uh, it, it's it's also um, you know there was a old saying zor ka jhatka dheere se lage i think that it it's that kind of really uh, sums it up because it's 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 been a life changing force like we have all uh, you never expected we'd be spending so much time at home i never expected that our social lives would be impacted in such a way the only way of actually dealing with um, the virus is actually to stay away from people but uh, this was this was i mean you know even when you imagine the apocalypse you never really imagine it in the form of a small little you know sub microbe uh, so to speak uh, it it has been uh, you know uh, the 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 realization has has been slow to onset uh, and and to really fully uh, grasp where we are and we still uh would be erroneous if we said that we fully understand what's going to happen to us in the future and what we need to do now uh, i think we are all trying to find ways of of trying to be relevant i think that's one big stress on all of us we are all really struggling now we said we must do something we must find a way to find our own relevance you know for restaurants we are trying uh, to do online delivery etc but we but but you know i think that we just have to kind of accept that this is Uh, going to happen we have to let it run its course i suppose and uh, hopefully you know two years later things or maybe less than that things will slowly start limping back to normalcy uh but yeah i, I you know i wish uh, i had any answers right now i think uh, you know as the situation evolves we just have to try and respond uh, the best way we can absolutely riaz um rachel i'm sorry when when i had to introduce you my computer went blank which is why i kind of went blank but uh, i think you figured that uh, you know uh, i'm going to do that later but i really want to know from you how are the desserts shaping up and we are missing all your desserts and uh, are you able to find time to an inspiration to write more stuff so tell us how your story has been um it's been chaotic it's been very really frustrating and i think uh, especially for people who've got uh, children it's been you know all the more frustrating and chaotic and then that coupled with uh, all the issues we're facing at work as well uh i don't think like riaz also said you know it's not something that anybody could ever prepare for or plan for and it happened so fast and you know if you remember the restaurants actually went into oh, shut down before the lockdown even happened so i think it's just um, i think we're just trying to adapt trying to sort of survive right now and uh, what we also need to take into account is you know work is one thing your personal life is one thing the mental health of people has also been so severely affected because this has just been going on for so long we don't know how long it's going to go on for we don't know if there's an end in sight either so right now i think a lot of people need to just focus on their mental health more than anything to make sure that you know you're not just uh, going nuts out of frustration i mean it's happened to me a couple of times i've just no, it's happened to all of us yeah. i think we all have kind of found uh, some ways to get back um but i think it's a new reality as well a lot more think, focus yeah. on mental health conversations yeah thanks uh, rachel moving to soma uh, fmcg hasn't uh, 
well uh, you've still seen some kind of action but would be very interesting which is why i really wanted to have you on this panel to get a little cross section of conversations tell us how these four months have been and how have the waves and the dips been the last four months i would say is something that no b school or no textbook can teach you i mean it was something that just threw you uh, you know into the action uh, directly but then the way i would look at it is it's it's also an opportunity that comes up when you least expect for example being in the industry that i am in we have seen a flurry of innovations happening a lot of new products coming in because the consumer needs suddenly changed and the way that i i personally spent my last four months was continuously interviewing consumers trying to understand what is going on in their lives and understanding their needs and getting back and coming up with the products that could possibly make us as an organization relevant to them and that's what i heard uh, riaz also talking about you know how do we make ourselves relevant in the current situation um sorry so my lost i think we lost soma he will uh, come back yeah yeah i'm so sorry we got disconnected yeah so i mean uh, we have been basically very busy and in fact uh, one of the jokes that was around was the moment we saw so many hand sanitizer brands coming up uh, even auto industry coming up with a hand sanitizer brand the thing was we were half looking at maybe google and facebook who would come back with their own brand of hand sanitizers so uh, the thing is it's all happening but what we are focusing on is what is consumer going through today what is most important for them and how is it that we can be a part of that chaos that uh, i heard rachel also talking about and hence you know um, also the good part is that godrej as an organization was also born uh, when a crisis happened it was during india's struggle for independence that godrej as an organization came in so for us it is also an opportunity that we are looking at you know how can we capitalize on the current situation and give consumers what they need the most yeah so i mean i would not talk about doom and gloom but rather look at it as something which positively shows us the new path the new normal as we are and that is the the, the most spoken words are new normal how how that shows us the path and how can we participate in it and positively at that absolutely thanks so much i think that's the reason i had you here <laughs> anyways um, so now we're going to go uh, one by one to all the speakers we have we have a lot of questions and um, um you know keep chiming in if any of you want to say anything so i'm going to start with dk again so a couple of days back when i was speaking to you about today uh, we spoke about externalities and how it's all interconnected how all our fates are intertwined and how a collective approach is what's needed so can you just take the audience very simply and you know briefly as to what this actually meant you started off with a jargon which economists really love to use but i think before i say anything let me reiterate again that uh, this uh, we are still learning about uh, what's going on uh, with covid-19 and what kind of implications we it will have until the time we get a medical resolution we are in uncharted territory i think uh, that's i think so that's a given so this is a condition in which you are trying to look ahead now externality i think in in economics i think it's used to refer to um, i mean when you produce something or you consume something or a particular behavior is what you indulge in i think that has implications for others and uh, for some people who are not intended uh, for instance if i smoke i mean uh, then i think i'm i may cause cancer to people who are around i mean uh, for, and, and who have nothing to do with that and the market mechanisms can't take care of it government has to step in with regulation so those are the kind of negative externalities in the textbook definition there are positive externalities also in the current context it could be vaccination for instance if i if i get myself vaccinated uh, uh, what it means is the uh, the spread of influenza will will be less and i think people will be less exposed so i am creating a positive uh, positivity in the system instead of smoking so that's a that's a that's the positive externality now i think in as far as uh, the the pandemic is concerned i think what people were referring to uh, i mean the the jobs are being lost the the economy is going to shrink i think these are the negative externalities uh, as we say of 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 the pandemic and i think let me come to uh, how how this plays out and so that so that you have a much clearer understanding uh people the way they behave Uh, if if i i'm worried about my own self let's say 
uh, I, I'll be more concerned that I shouldn't catch the disease. I'll be worried about getting hospitalized. I'll be even worried about dying, for instance. So people will be very, very in their own self-interest, very concerned about not catching the virus. But they will not be equally concerned about spreading the virus. For instance, I mean, uh, 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 their behavior may not fully internalize the fact that they can spread the virus. They can be asymptomatic. They can be moving around. They can. So that is so. So the negative externality flows from that, and that is, I think, in in whenever you have externalities, whether it is positive or it is negative, in the negative externality, you typically tax or impose a particular behavior. In a positive externality, I think you try to incentivize that further. So, for instance, I think you would like to incentivize wearing of masks because people on their own may not wear mask. I mean, unless they are told, if you tell them that it is going to prevent the virus from spreading to others, they may not be induced to do that. That's human behavior. So they would like, to, if, but if you tell them that it will protect you also, then they might be induced. Something so now, like positive reinforcement. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's in, in jargon, it is called externality. But I think the, the point is there is a lot of, uh, so you have to incentivize the, 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 the positive sides, uh, externalities. For instance, wearing a mask has a positive externality. And I think the negative sides, you have to curb. Now, what happens in this, uh, in this uh, scenario is, I think, let's look at India for a moment, I mean, to, to take it a step further. So that's the externality part. So this is a negative externality and private sector cannot do anything about it. Government has to step in just as they step in to regulate pollution or smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, uh, uh, if, I, uh, if I look at India as a whole, I mean, it's a densely populated country. We all know that. It's all, we also know that our health infrastructure is not good. So what is the, how do you control, uh, how do you reduce this negative externality? Well, what you try to do is you, you in, impose a lockdown, for instance, or social distancing, as Riyaz was saying. So once you do that, I think uh, the, uh, the virus control is, uh, is, uh, is, I mean, you might be able to control it for some time, as we saw in India as well. But after some time, the other side of it, which is, uh, which is uh, the, the, the negative side of it also starts playing out. I mean, you're trying to control one negativity, but you are locking down the economy. And as a consequence of that, uh, the, the jobs are getting lost. So when government is imposing such a restriction on the economy that you can't uh, participate in economic activity, then it is their responsibility to also protect the vulnerable. It is their responsibility to also uh, protect the businesses uh, who are uh, who are undergoing pain. So it's 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 a very complex complex web of externalities that that kind of uh, play out through this. And eventually, I think I would say that since government doesn't have the fiscal the money to spend to protect all the businesses or vulnerable, so they have started opening it up at a time when the the curve is uh, instead of flattening is is moving steep ahead. So I think this is. This broadly, I think, explains uh, the, 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 the phenomena. And I think individuals have to be influenced, have to be induced, so that the positive externalities of ac their actions show up and the negative externalities go down. I think that's, that's sorry for that long-winded answer. No, no, I, it's, it's clear. I think, uh, you know, um, it is onto us, I guess. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. I think collectively, you have to do it. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, it, it the, the government will have a role to ensure that that the the, the collective welfare is is maximized through through the actions of the people I mean so that's that's the whole whole story of this. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, come back to you uh, Manish um, Manish could you quickly sum up um, or let's say throw light on how the MSME sector is so relevant to the heartbeat of the country and what are the biggest challenges it's faced of course we know of a lot of them but have they changed in the last four months and what are your immediate uh, concerns and what are some stats and figures there? Um. So, um, I'll try to approach the problem very simplistically. Uh, we cater to micro, small and medium entrepreneurs in around 300 odd locations span India. And uh, overall, we have disbursed around 16,000, 15, 16,000 crores in these markets. A number of customers we cater to is around five lakh customers. So our sample size is pretty large. Uh, now let's dissect where really is the problem. We still believe that the markets which have high population density, especially the uh, the metros and the peri-urbans, uh, clearly there is a looming problem. And the situation over here 
is what all of us sitting here believe that the reality uh, but we have also seen that over last two months especially after the lockdown has lifted uh, clearly the rural and semi urban collections have come very close to levels of normalcy so we believe that if our collections were sub 50% in the month of june we are very close to 70% collections and uh, the agri sector has actually begun to play out well we had decent monsoons and i also believe that uh, that the two crops rabi and kharif they having done well uh, i would feel that tractor sales being all time high so that a positive side of industry is that the impact of covid 19 is differentiated it is not unilateral across similarly so different strokes for different folks so we need to have a strategy maybe so much we can talk about godrej experience as to how do they sight and see things the second important thing is that let's look at an msme pragmatically in last 3 months they have probably done one month of equivalent business which they would have done last year and next 9 months i think they'll be lucky if they do 6 to 7 months of equivalent business so therefore what it really means is that in 12 months of operative business this particular year they will be lucky if they are able to operate for 8 months my sense is way more like 7 to 8 months which means that most smes are likely to see a 30 to 40% reduction in top line hypothetically if let's take a situation that if an sme did a turnover of one crore per month obviously over here they are doing much more larger numbers and last year they did 12 crores this year they may end up doing 7 to 8 crores last year on 12 crores they would have made probably a crore of net margin it could vary from 50 lakhs on one side to one and a half crore on the other side but the ranges are normally like this effectively it meant that last year their cost was 10 and a half to 11 crores and a 12 crore turnover let's put it 11 crore this particular year if their top line is going to be 8 crore the single largest issue for most smes should be survival and not profitability i think what is really going to be important what everybody is really thinking is that how do i get my cost down effectively they have to go back to the drawing board and we are actually working with vadwani foundation from the us and more than 500 smes have been selected where we are getting a bunch of serious advisors who would look at business from various lenses and i think the time is really here to really have a hard look considering three key key aspects one is the demand and second is covid these two are definitely driving massive digitization uh, we can't believe but even in smaller markets the aged have adopted technology far more better than what we would have thought through so the positive of covid or the covidian gift as i would say is digitization the second important thing is the e-commerce and online business will flourish and all the allied industries which are nutraceuticals pharma or so to say covid positive industries those are industries immuno boosters they will be doing well the logistics around the metros that will be doing well the entrepreneurs currently have to go back and look at the cost structure are they labor intensive salaries are highest fixed cost the highest or is it that you are over leveraged your interest cost the highest so you have to really go back and look at the financial engineering and go dissect a problem for example if somebody is into a capital intensive business for example restaurants owner etc and and they pay a high amount of rent obviously you can't be owning so many properties it may be time to really renegotiate because i believe that the commercial real estate market is gone for a long time and it may be a case to reopen dialogue and see how you can create a flexible architecture for example how can rentals can come into profit sharing model and vice versa so i guess some of these structures which are quasi equity structures or equity distribution how do you deleverage how do you conserve cash and essentially put your head down like an ostrich and brave the storm for a year have a two year plan in mind and really go on surviving than thinking anything else and actually think about recasting the model having survived so these are the my few quick views on how as we see things thank you you made the uh, right kind of statement for me to go to riaz now um riaz um after hearing manish i think it's um, i had a separate question for you in mind but now i have another one um a lot of first time restaurateurs a lot of people who dream of having restaurants 
look up to you. So I want to know from you, what do you think has changed and what do you think needs to change? Keeping in mind what Mani just said, the two-year view and not an immediate view. What is your <laughs> sense on that? I wish I knew, Pallavi. I really do. Um, I can only tell you that, look, people don't go out to restaurants because they're hungry. Right. They're not going there. It's not. I mean, of course, you know, there will be the occasional place where you go. You're, you're feeling a little peckish. You want to go get something, and you know. But you're really going to fill a need, which is the need to be social. Right. It is the need to basically celebrate life. You use restaurants uh, to go to celebrate uh, your birthday, your anniversary, getting a job, getting fired, getting engaged, getting breaking up. You know, these are all different. You know, and and the real thing is, yeah, you're commiserating with each other as as people. And uh, and that's the real primary need that you're really fulfilling by going to a restaurant. The secondary need, of course, is the food and everything else. But that is a very important aspect of what a restaurant is actually hawking, in a sense. It's the social experience. It's a sense of elevation. In the sense that oh, you you are communing with your city. You're communing with other cultures wherever you're going. You know, there's there's a lot of that. It's not just food. So it's really hard. I mean, there's this very dangerous narrative that oh, restaurants can do deliveries and it's all going to be okay. It, it's not because we are not set up for deliveries. Delivery needs a kitchen. You need a 300 square foot kitchen, and that's that. And when in a restaurant, you need you create decor. You take a wide space, probably the most expensive real estate. And you know, it is weird that in in uh, there's 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 a huge uh, you know a fault line in the restaurant business in India because the rentals are all first world. Right, if you can get uh, Pawai, for example, is more expensive than Mayfair in London right now. Uh, at least it was. I mean, you know, these big companies that have come in and uh, they've taken over Brookfield, for example, uh, is is more expensive than than running in Mayfair. But your purchasing power parity is actually third world in many ways. What people would expect to pay for a price is is very different. Yeah. Uh, the, our, our notion of what stands for good service is also very, very different, right? In an Indian restaurant, you you look up, you want to make eye contact with people immediately. You want to see somebody, you look up, you want to make eye contact, you want your glass is half full, you want somebody to come and top it up. You know, there's one butt uh, of in your ashtray, you want somebody to come and replace it. So service expectations are also very, very high, right? So there, there, there was a fault line which was already existing in, in the restaurant business in India. Now, as as, uh, as as Mr. Manish just said, you know, the commercial real estate is gone, but for a, from a landlord's perspective, he's still holding on to his old model. He still feels that he's given you, you know, properties worth crores. Anyway, his yield was 3% or 2% annually based on his property price at that point of time. And now you're asking for a further reduction. He is not going to be accepting it anytime soon. So unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of value erosion in the restaurant business. And there's going to be a lot of bloodbath because... What we have to understand that even once uh, the business, even let's assume that the cure is found and widely distributed amongst the population, there's not going to be a single person who is going to be escaped from the financial implications of this. This uh, right, uh, you are not getting any government support. You're seeing the payment protection programs which have happened in the West have lot led to a very quick regeneration of demand. But here, because hardly any person I know who has not had a pay cut or lost a job, hardly any business I know besides uh, the few businesses uh, mentioned by Mr. Joshi and Mr. Jaiswal, which is delivery, logistics, et cetera, online entertainment, uh, that have not suffered because of that. So, and restauranting is discretionary spend. So it is, we are going to be, unfortunately, I don't have too much good news. And this is absolutely the worst time to get into the restauranting business. Uh, even delivery, people are not ordering as much from outside because of the trust deficit. Um, people are, uh, you know, a little hesitant, oh, you know, what, what happens if uh, it comes in through the packaging, even though there's tremendous evidence to show that it doesn't really transmit through packaging. In fact, it's safer to order cooked food from outside, which you can reheat, than to, uh, you know, take in other like groceries. Everything is all coming from outside, but there is a severe mental block. And the way restaurants are set up, they're not prepared for delivery right now. The models don't work. And delivery itself has taken a big hit. Actually, we are seeing the reverse trend. We are seeing uh, people uh, going to ordering from restaurants that they've been to and they trust rather than the dark kitchen uh, uh, platforms, right? So the dark kitchen platform, we've seen uh, almost a 70% erosion in that business. But uh, we've seen a 100% growth 
in uh, uh, in ordering it from restaurant where people actually know the brand they've been to that restaurant they've touched it they felt it they know what their standards are so they have a lot more confidence from ordering there so right now we are in a very strange um, space restaurants are i think the only response for a restaurant right now is to become a virus themselves i mean uh, in a sense that you know a virus typically uh, when it is outside a favorable condition or a host goes into kind of no life support systems needed and when favorable conditions uh, you know you find a host then maybe you want to uh, then unfurl yourself but the tricky bit is how do you actually survive for that because uh, landlords are not going to agree for, uh, you know to not take rent for whatever and there's just no way you can afford paying the rent so we are between a rock and a hard place right now and uh, i think uh, you know the future will belong to good operators because then real estate will become available but operators will be scarce uh, so but maintaining and trying to conserve current value that you build because it takes crores you know you plumbing electrical civil work all these things take a lot and the decor these are not things that you can get back these are sunken costs from the day you open your restaurant they're gone so trying to conserve that value for a favorable timeline is our number one priority right now and okay. trying to minimize trying to minimize the cost and also the weird part is that the baseline has actually come down in terms of real estate prices but landlords will expect that baseline to you know it come back to normal so even if you preserve the value there's no guarantee that there'll be a profitable model when we open up so, so, so unfortunately it's not the greatest time to be a restaurant my only tip is wait and watch stay away for now you know and then wait for better conditions and what you definitely foresee is rescaling or recalibration across the across the table we'll see too many closures and um the good ones will survive and there's no guarantee even the good ones surviving honestly pallavi the future will belong to partnerships where we we will be able to enter into partnerships with with real estate owners and operators operator skills will be in demand because there'll be a lot of real estate available but very few skilled operators but to try and maintain current value built will be a challenge okay um, i expected nothing else but yes um hope to hang in there and uh, really looking forward to get back to the restaurants what else can i say um rachel i'm going to come to you with a slightly uh, different question um because i know that you're uh, right now sitting in goa and at your home and maybe you can kind of tell us as to why we need restaurants so much like we are told us but what are the roles restaurants play in community uh, in improving community sentiment so i think that's what people are kind of forgetting in all of this conversation about the virus and you know um, and the reason that i had two of you in fact i plan more uh, i plan prashant as well is that i uh, for us in pawai especially because we are pawai live restaurants have meant um, or eating out celebrations have been have meant a lot to us so tell us as to how um, that can come back or how and what part of it you really missing that that bond you know it's like riyas uh, explained i mean people don't go out just to eat food people go out for an experience people go out to celebrate an occasion and that's why people have their favorite restaurants where they frequent so often so as far as the community is concerned and restaurants being part of a community i think um you know it it's it's sort of a given that restaurants automatically become ingrained in a community for that reason but you know if you if you see a lot of us we will constantly try and support the local talent whether it's an artist whether it's somebody who's you know into music or whatever it is for why being such a community uh, centric um, uh, place i mean you know we've done like the pawai mums group we've done something with them there's so many other groups that we've constantly been collaborating with and and i think you know it's it's not just about doing something for them it's actually sort of integrating and collaborating and becoming part of that community along with them as well so uh and, and restaurants constantly do this you know whether you're curating something specially for that particular group it you know it could be a master class it could be like a high tea it could be uh, a launch event but you're just being very supportive of a particular community and the various groups within that community perfect we're missing all of that and i think uh, um hope to see that soon and uh, yeah, it's also you know it's part about sort of becoming you know part of the fabric of that particular community and like uh, riyas does is brilliantly with social as well you know 
I think both of you do a fab job. We just kind of, I can't say it enough. We are looking forward to the times to be normal. But anyways, moving on, um, I'm going to come back to you, Rachel. Soma, you have, um, uh, FMCG demand has, uh, is a strong indicator of economic revival at, of sorts. Could you comment on whether, where do you see it? What are the levels you're seeing it return to at? And what are your uh, um, insights as to where is it seeing an uptick and where is it not? Um, so, you know, uh, FMCG actually broadly, if you divide it into essentials and discretionary, what we are seeing is across strata, whether you are a high monthly household income household, like let's say the poor kind of households, or uh, you are the lower, of, of, uh, you know, uh, lower income group. What we have seen is that there has been definite reduction in the discretionary items. For example, people have thronged for hygiene requirements. People have thronged for, you know, anything that has to do with health. For example, whether it's soaps, whether it's... Uh, uh, sanitizers, whether it's in fact uh, increased, significant increase we have seen in categories which have anything to do with hygiene, like the floor cleaners, disinfectants, etc. For obvious reasons, because people are saying that I don't want to fall ill, whether with COVID or not, I don't want to fall ill because I don't want to visit the hospital. Because even if I don't have COVID today, going to hospital is a huge, huge risk, right? So they are doing everything at home that they feel would cause them any kind of risk and hence taking care of their own health. In fact, we are seeing a good surge in even our household insecticides business because people again see mosquitoes and insects, etc., as a huge risk because dengue malaria with the season also changing. I mean, COVID also had to happen at a time when every other ailment also sort of hits the society. So people want to stay away from that. So we are seeing those essential items which impact you immediately, your health, etc. they are really sort of going up. But the discretionary items, let's say um, things like air fresheners, et cetera, are something that people are saying that, okay, that is something I can sort of keep it at bay. Un unless, of course, I mean, it's uh, like a necessity in a high, high, uh, month, uh, you know, um, income kind of, high income kind of household, where people, for them, it's a natural process that I have to fragrance my houses every day and all. It becomes a part of discretionary. Um, so that is one thing we are seeing. Second thing we are also observing is, like I think Riaz also partly mentioned that, like people are okay with buying food from restaurants that they trust. You know, when I have seen the infrastructure, etc., and I know they maintain hygiene, etc., I'm okay to getting food from there. It works really for the FMCG brands as well. This is a time where people are not experimenting as much with newer brands. They are going with the brands which they trust, the brands which are giving them a lot of information as to why I'm good, why I'm better, better than the others who are talking to them and giving them what they need. Those are the brands. So potentially the brands which are market leaders, they are doing really well. The biggest interesting thing that I'm seeing also is that the DIY kind of solution, which is do it yourself kind of solutions are really going up in requirement. For example, whether you are at home or not, you want to still look good. And the first thing you have actually stopped during COVID times is stopped going to salons. In fact, you know, uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed with the hairdo that all the men over here have. I don't know how you managed it because I have been cutting my husband's hair. So, <laughs> yes, so that's the reality. What people are doing is they're managing at home. So the solutions, the brands which are enabling them to do things at home are really sort of doing well. Like for us, the good indicator is Godrej Expert uh, coloring solution, hair coloring solution. That is sort of doing really well. Uh, similarly, you are not able to call in pest control at home. While in season change, you really want your home to be absolutely pest free. And of course, because you want to stay healthy, you want your home clean, but then you are, you are not really trusting to get the pest control guys home because you don't know who has been where, whether they have COVID or not, right? So you need solutions which you can use for yourself and can give you that kind of efficacy. So brands which offer efficacy, they are the brands which are being you know, uh, in demand. So a lot of these factors, being it essential versus a discretionary. Similarly, um, 
it may not be relevant to the poor audience but in reality is that people's finances have been hit people are losing jobs and like we obviously heard from manish uh, uh, mr joshi and riyas people are losing losing their jobs hence they are becoming very very frugal so in the lower strata what we are seeing is that the sku size when you say sku it means the price point at which i'm buying a particular product right for example i would buy a smaller pack in the lower uh, strata of the society is that something we are seeing smaller packs are becoming big but yes the positive thing that uh, in fact uh, mr manish uh, pointed out was is rural economy seeing an upsurge because a lot of migrant workers have actually gone back to their bases and because the sowing season etc the monsoon has come at the right time just at the time for sowing etc is that seeing a surge well sir uh, yes definitely we are seeing a positive movement over there but that as an fmcg also worries us a bit because these are the same migrant workers if they go back and they stick on to farming it will put a question on our own productions because finally they are also the workers that we depend on we depend on them for our distribution channel we depend on them for the production in the factory so i mean it there are pros and cons of the whole thing but then yes rural surely rural, rural economy is something will be interesting to watch out for this year one quick question soma in a very short answer if possible uh, your overall demand uh, expectations for the fiscal year definitely lower ah uh, as in um, are you are you asking me whether our business no i'm just saying i'm just no i'm not asking a, a typical question i'm trying to understand as to overall demand are you like what manish said right we were expecting a 7 to 8 month kind of a, a production or a business demand in a 12 month period what are you guys i mean is fmcg holding on to its ground or the demands are enough a very so, rough Uh, so it's like this. It depends on which sector you are operating in, the products that you are operating in. If you are in the essential sector where people depend you on you for their own well-being, etc., that is a sector which which we are thriving and actually do very well over there. And I think Godrej is one of those companies where we are blessed with having most of the essential items and the needs that people have, and also the kind of innovations we have. For example. and watches are the biggest necessity that you have right now but they are very costly they are perceived perceived to be really costly so we have uh, something which is one third the cost that powder dry hand wash that you would call you know where you pour in powder uh, into a liquid in water and it becomes a liquid hand wash with one th- at one third the cost so those kind of innovations if they are there will ensure that your your particular company will continue growing so it's really a function of what is the kind of product that your company is associated with so trust efficacy trust efficacy and what's essential discretionary ah uh, yes i mean being present in the products that matter to people right now are are they enabling you to do things yourself at the same level of efficacy in fact the other interesting indicator obviously is imagine the amount of food that we are uh, food recipes that we are trying out ourselves we are not ordering out we are doing the, it ourselves at home so how much are you enabling people i mean just some of those examples so it really depends on whether the, they trust your brand or not are you enabling people to do the, it themselves at home are your products efficacious and delivering on the promise that uh, they are going to call, call out more importantly are the brands talking to you one of the biggest debates in the entire fmcg industry has been that during lockdown if you are suspecting that the demand will come down should we advertise or not and every study material and every case study throwing up that please do not remain absent from consumers uh you know uh, let's say friends of mine station said please continue talking to the consumers do not expect that if you're off for four months people will still remember you because they love you no they love you because they need you and they want you when they need you got it so you better be present so it was Yeah. Thank you so much for that. very insightful uh, round of discussion. I'm going to go to um, DK. DK, quickly, can you can you uh, remind? Uh, can you kind of take us through what has what have been some of the um, um, kind of very um, not similar though, but um, you know uh, similar situations the world has been in before, and what has led us out of those, and how will recovery look at this look like this time? I mean, I know it's a very um, It can be a very long-winded answer, but uh, what? 
So I think uh, uh, we have been through many crises, but I think in the recent memory, this is what, as Riaz and others are pointing out, this is something uh, of a magnitude which we haven't seen. I mean, so this is the mother of all crises in that sense. Uh, the closest, uh, the re most recent crisis was the global financial crisis. I'll talk about it. But this crisis is, is far more deeper and deadlier than that. And uh, the, the, uh, the, this would be closer to what would have happened 100 years back uh, during Spanish flu, maybe, uh, in terms of uh, uh, misery that it caused. Or I think you can say the Great Recession in US. I think these go to the incidents that will be closer. Now, what happened, I think, since uh, global financial crisis is most recent in our memory, what happened during that time was it was uh, a financial sector-led uh, uh, shock to the world economy. And this, uh, this started from United States. Uh, so it created a demand shock, so to say. Now, what is happening currently is, 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 it, it, is it didn't start as a demand shock. It started as a supply shock because US, you brought the economy to a sudden stop. I mean, the, 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 many of the economies went into lockdowns. What that meant was the, the growth or the activity fell off a cliff. I mean, it was just a very, very deep uh, drop. Uh, what happens with that is as, as the economic activity stops, the incomes of the people also start getting hurt. Then it becomes a demand shock because their ability to buy, to survive, I think that reduces. So it's a very complex web of, uh, of, of a supply shock morphing into a demand shock. So that is that. Uh, so that that's and so it's uh, it, during the global financial crisis we gave a huge amount of stimulus. I think the U.S. economy, uh, uh, the, the the monetary stimulus was massive. The fiscal spending was also there, but it was essentially I think the monetary authorities, the central bank, the Fed, which uh, which uh, which uh, led the uh, the the the, uh, the stimulus, so to say, and helped the economies come out of it. They had quantitative easing, negative interest rates. All sorts of things started happening. Now, what's in this crisis? I think monetary policy has a role. I mean, our RBI is also cutting interest rates and trying to pump liquidity, uh, trying to provide credit wherever they can. Uh, but this is this crisis is cannot be sorted out by monetary policy alone. It requires a fiscal support. I think this is as the as the Fed uh, governor had said. We have the uh, we have the lending power, not the spending power. You need spending power in this. That is why you're seeing massive stimulus being given across the world. Now, India's unfortunately doesn't have that kind of a fiscal space. I mean, because our fiscal deficits are already high. We are, uh, uh, as far as our credit ratings are concerned, we are just on the edge of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 investment grade country. So I think we need to be a little cautious with fiscal spending. So there is a lot of confusion as to what we should do. See, rich countries have followed what I think uh, the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz said was a fire hose approach. You saw the pandemic and you just started reacting to that with whatever, and you have in a way unlimited resources. I think even uh, the, the ratings country of uh, countries like UK, US, et cetera, will not be impacted that much even. So in, the, in India's case, I think what, uh, what, what we might see is so the policy as we see, the, uh, the, 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 as I said earlier, the go government has a massive uh, role to play in, in this crisis. So, the way we view it is that so policy is like a bridge. I mean, it has to take you from the crisis to the recovery phase, right? Which means pr uh, protecting the vulnerable sections, providing them food, and put also protecting vulnerable businesses. Uh, so once you take them across the bridge, then the, when the recovery phase starts, they will not be in healthy condition. So they'll again need support. So that is so. I think our our support system has been that uh, that uh, that we are we are helping uh, 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 we are. We're trying to keep the powder dry. We'll help in the recovery phase, but not in the bridge phase. So that is why I think we haven't seen the kind of uh, support that has been announced by the chancellor in UK, for instance, for, for small businesses. We haven't seen here. One, we don't have the money and we want to keep the powder dry. So what will the recovery look like? I think very, very hard question. It will depend on how the virus plays out. I think the, so you have, so if the epidemiologists are correct, and we see peaking out of the virus in this uh, in the current quarter. Let's say July is the is going to see the peak, and then slowly I think we uh, we we come to a situation where it's under reasonable control. Under those conditions, I think uh, uh, so. First quarter of this year, April to June, minus 25% drop in GDP. We are saying next quarter again we'll see negative growth. Uh, after that, I think if if the virus is un reasonably under control, you'll start seeing somewhat some positive activity returning. So there are people are talking about green shoots. 
They're forgetting that you fell off the cliff in the month of April. And because the economy was slowly opened up, you started improving. Your activity is still below the lower than the levels of last year. So I think unless you cross the last year's level, we can't talk of a meaningful, uh, meaningful recovery. And uh, there's no sign of that happening, unfortunately, because even though we are unlocking, calling it unlocking, but you look at, look around the country, I mean, many places are seeing even stringent lockdowns being reintroduced. So it will be a wobbly, I think, path. It will be up and down. So clearly, the the the, the transition from the, the virus-infected uh, economy to a normal economy is going to be extremely complicated. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about it. And I don't think people have the tools to fully assess how it's going to play out. I think we keep now government is also not able to publish data I and mean, for instance inflation data for april the industrial production data for april was not released uh, in its entirety so it was only partially released so what do you do so you start looking at blue uh, google activity indicators uh, looking at electricity production so we're trying to look at all these things to see how how things are improving so overall economic activity is still below last year's ever, uh, level and there is no meaningful recovery in sight in the in the in this in the current quarter i mean so maybe after this if the virus is under control we might see some uh, wait and watch yeah yeah wait it's it's wait and watch and being i mean continuously assessing and reassessing because this is this is a non linear event i mean as again i don't want to use the jargon non linear means that you can't see the path so you can't see the path of the virus and you can't see the path of what the lockdown will do to the economy because the economy has been opened up partly but there are synergies in the economy. If you keep one part closed and another part open, the entire economy, the synergies can't be realized. So obviously, I think we are in that phase where the, the benefit from opening up the economy is disproportionately less than, uh, less than the extent of opening up in some areas. OK. Um, um, moving to Manish from DK, uh, you know, he says the enterprises are on to themselves. So, um, you know, your sector, the kind of enterprises that you deal with, they are seeing a lot of issues, working capital, liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. And you said that you're working with a lot of enterprises abroad to kind of help them look at and revisit their cost bases or kind of how they're structured. A lot of people sent us questions for you specifically and uh, you know, as owners of small and medium-sized enterprises, what are the few levers that you've seen that are emerging as ones that can be, you know, that can be flexed in order to kind of survive this uh, absolutely brutal phase in the next uh, three to six months? Oh, I wish if I had a magic wand to answer such a tough question. Um, uh, having said that, uh, I can only tell you what is the government intent and what's happening right now, what could be done. The first and foremost important thing for all entrepreneurs is to stay liquid. And I think liquidity is key. And at the same time, I would say Right sizing is absolutely essential. Uh, therefore, capital conservation in this particular year has to be uh, the single most largest important agenda. So I would say that prioritization or survival this year is going to be important. Um, the things to really talk about is the government's Aat Nirbhar program where the Honorable Finance Minister has put out an amount of three lakhs of debt uh, so far, around a lakh and ten thousand crore has been sanctioned. Fifty-six thousand crore has been gone down. I think uh, while the intent of the government is in place, I feel the execution content has been not really been up to the mark. So there has been issues of liquidity transmission. So, so to speak, liquidity should be available on tap for good entrepreneurs who have not defaulted. The conditions are very clear that if your delays pass due is less than 60 days on 29th of February, 20% of your loan outstanding is what you would be entitled to at 9.25% from the public sector banks or the banks and from NBFCs at 14%. So this scheme is pretty much on and I think uh, it would be imperative that uh, those under stress should suddenly ensure that they have the liquidity taps running. Um, the second important thing, which is that we believe at the moment that there are certain government scheme and subventions which were on till 31st of March, for example, the MSME interest subvention scheme, it has yet not been reinstated. We really hope and pray and I hope that the government in these pandemic times uh, really notes this and actually stalls it back because we could get 17 crore of interest subvention and we actually credit to the entrepreneur accounts 
to 6000 entrepreneur accounts in last 3 months time during pandemic for some reason uh, i really wonder why this scheme is not been reinstated on the contrary they have come up with some mudra yojana scheme where there is subvention available but nothing really for the entrepreneurs of the country so that is something where uh, we are making an impassioned plea and i really hope all entrepreneurs join hand and they really uh, make that happen the third and most important thing which i believe is actually entrepreneurs to do themselves and the solutions will have to be figured out within their own business models uh, i think it is going to be very insular it is going to be something which they would perhaps need to really go back to the drawing board as i stated earlier and i feel that they should take a more longer term view maybe all together look at uh, i am we the way we see things for example we have 3 lakh square feet of space pan india our model has changed we are saying that our guys need not go to the branch at all you should do your morning huddle the way we are doing on zoom between 9 to 10 from 10 to 6 meet your customers go back home the branch should be downsized so there will be abundance of real estate available we could be vacating large spaces forget one year from now maybe in next in this quarter itself and right sizing cutting down cost maybe by more than 100 crores this year we should probably be doing it this year so when this is the lay of the land i feel uh, right sizing is key figuring out that uh, minimalism is a key word and everybody in the country would be conserving cash this year so having realized this is the lay of the land and figuring out the marketing spends public spends all would translate to online spends so i i believe that the the shift will be so accelerated so fast that you need to be lean agile nimble adapt very fast i think those who would be uh, carrying baggages and do not really come up with flexible architecture in their business models uh, they will be deep stress i mean i for example i would i'm just i am i'm could making it up maybe a social in goregaon might actually might might do better than the social in 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 kolhapur i'm just yeah as the best guy to comment but i i feel that there will be a explosion the the way we look at employment will change why do we need people to be staying in bombay to serve us when they are working out of home they can might be as in panvel they can be in pune they can be anywhere the why do we why can't we tap for example the housewives at home uh, who typically can give who are very competent very educated far, very sensible they can give four five of their work hours at probably half the cost so i guess uh, this is just a shock which is beginning to happen the tremors of it will go through and it will cause upheaval disturbances and very long term structural tectonic shifts in in couple of years time and we have to prepare for it i hear you i completely hear you riyaz in fact you know i had something else to ask you but i will now go on to this you know social the first time when we heard of social the first, most fascinating thing about it was the fact that you can work there in the in the in the day time you know so i think agility has somewhere been at the very core and the heart of whatever you've done with some of your spaces so um, essentially my question to you is 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 around that that how do you think uh, where all do you see uh, of course your uh, your business, your brands and your restaurants but other restaurants and fnbs also pivoting i mean what are the places that you know uh, soma mentioned diy uh, trust you know your brands are trusted i i know that i've ordered a lot of social in the lockdown so how do you continue to be a relevant to the consumer aware and them kind of being in touch with you your social media is very strong but some of those ways as to you know what are you guys doing to kind of you know be there and be a part of our lives and how do you pivot from here um, on some of those things as a you know i fully agree with soma that you have to customers will forget you if you stop talking to them uh, you know and i think restauranters have been trying uh, really hard to be relevant of course they've been uh, putting up uh, great pictures of 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 food throwbacks yeah and throwbacks and also i think you know I, after some time i mean food is such a thing that you seek variety you know and that's and that's the reason why you have such a multitude of restaurants and aaj indian khaya to kal chinese khayenge ya aaj south indian khaya to aaj dal chawal dopahar mein hi khaya tha yaar fir dal chawal nahi khaya the this is something that you do you do need variety so you know occasionally people will order from outside and we have these diy kits uh, where um, you know we send you things broken down in a format that kind of a knock down kit 
if you like and you can actually make it at home and uh, it's, a, it's a it's a kind of a family ritual you know your family can chip in and make things together or apne haath ka khana hamesha zyada tasty lagta you know i think that is uh, i'm bored of it completely <laughs> i'm done <laughs> i think that, that's a secret sauce but um, you know i mean these are these are you know these are incremental this, this is not going to materially impact our business and one of the challenges that we face and what mr jaiswal said what mr joshi said is that is it is non linear in the sense that not all countries are going to come out of it uh, equally and that is a, a big worry for me right um the challenge if you look at what happened in america they were expecting um, uh, joshi saab aap mujhe correct please correct me if i'm saying something stupid but uh, there was a 20% expected loss of their uh, jobs uh, and and that actually came to 13% and they were all trying to figure out why, how could the economists get it so wrong and a large part of the jobs that actually came back and 50% of the jobs were in the restaurant segment right and it is such a it is such a it, it's such a powerhouse of employment if you look at a retail store which is 1000 square feet you need four people to man it but if you look at a restaurant which is 1000 square feet you need 30 people to man it because you got so many different functions so it is it is so powerful when it comes to employment generation and if you if you don't like you know give it monetary and fiscal support right now uh i think it's just going to completely collapse because even coming out of the recession we're not going to have anything else the payment protection programs have become very very vital in the survival of our industry right demand is is both supply and demand problem but how else how will you generate demand even when the supply comes back right for example so these are these are very crucial and what we've seen even from uh, you know from the bank side where the government is telling you one thing uh the banks actually are actually blocking actively blocking our ability to raise more debt because they don't want their uh, la, you know uh, their collaterals to be uh inferior to any other collateral so far from giving us ability to be liquid we we've, we've actually uh, all all our chances of being liquid because we are in the negative category we are just not getting access to funds we've gone to the government and the government has said go atmanirbhar yourself and uh, you know and that's pretty much Uh, even when we go with, with we go with not uh, not with a begging bowl, but we go with we asking for favorable condition and you know rectifying uh, some challenges. Like we are such a regulated industry, we have so many. Like we we have thirty six different licenses that we need to get just to sell a sandwich. Right? Uh, it's ridiculous. You need twenty two to open up an ordnance factory, and you need thirty six to sell a sandwich. There's a huge disconnect. We ask for better conditions. We have possibly. uh the only industry which it uh, besides real estate which does not enjoy the benefit of input tax credit right so when you go to the government uh, and you ask for these favorable conditions it ease up the business make some structural changes so understand what a big uh, you know employment generator it is there's just it is just met with you know absolutely like it's almost seen like you are a rich man's indulgence you know we do we don't need you go we'll figure it out so any all, all this 20000 lakh uh, crore package whatever we've seen have we not really seen i don't know uh, mr manish i was very curious to ask you is the msme seeing uh, all the you know because the big part of the package was directed to the msme are you seeing this translation happening uh, for the msmes uh, or is there some there's a huge gap which we are seeing between what the government has said it'll happen and what's actually happening on the ground I think uh, uh, yes. To just to give you some sense of our numbers, we have selected around six thousand of of our customers out of eligible eligible customers under the program. Uh, the largest sample size is large, of course, but of the six thousand customers, uh, at the last count, and we gone totally truly digital. I know we our teams are locked in, customers are locked in. So uh, over last ninety days, uh, the way we amended our business model was that we did a post. of entire processing including digital agreement signing i mean sitting at home you just need to put in an otp and your agreement is done and we have been able to fulfill needs of 1800 of 1600 customers in last fortnight and our plan is by july we should have expanded uh, whoever wanted we presume even 50 60% if they want uh, liquidity in those times so we are uh, completely taking this uh, as if it is not liquidity infusion added with blood transfusion because we truly value that entrepreneurs really need liquidity at this stage and they have liabilities and they have obligations to fulfill so i think uh, it is the mission critical uh, for bankers and for non bankers to ensure that they do this 
and we are also representing to government that there are many such banks and non banks who typically are not in a position to uh, provide liquidity to the entrepreneurs and those who have liquidity or who have cash flows who are getting funding line from bank uh, rather you give guarantee to us so that we go and fulfill needs of those entrepreneurs um yeah. i really don't know which way it would go because the schemes are hard coded and it takes a certain amount of flexibility our dialogues are on right now as we speak personally i am also in touch with the uh, with the bureaucrats and the ministry and uh, i can only say that we hope it's a positive outcome because number of people who need solutioning and help right now is very large and i don't think that public sector banks uh, with all due respect to them that they will be in a position to move out of their branches and go to customers door in this cordian times and provide them liquidity so uh, it's it's a important one to crack so long as government decentralizes the process of giving guarantee to the financiers of choice i think uh, this could play out well execution is key their intent is absolutely in the right space but i believe that the planners have to really come together and say okay this is the execution model which should be flawless and therefore let's go ahead and benefit out the entrepreneurs so i guess it would be somewhere in that zone well, that's good to hear my that the intent is there i mean you know i mean and it's not just uh, uh, you know window dressing it's good to hear that the intent is there but you yeah, you're right you know i mean uh, the banks have not really gotten is not come to the party you know with with uh, with the whole heart so to speak they also very would, nervous i would entreat if you have a your bankers talk to them every banker is uh, completely should be supportive of 20% of your 29 february lines uh, giving you that liquidity at at nine quarter of that kind of a cost some are even offering lesser so uh, it could be also a case for education many entrepreneurs are not even aware about this so uh, the the transmission of knowledge to also seasoned entrepreneurs is in a way lacking so i would i would guess that the problem could be on both sides okay. manish you are right i think uh, you know honestly more than 70% of the questions that came to us on on facebook whatsapp were literally from entrepreneurs who were asking questions pretty much around the same uh, ballpark that you know uh, moratoriums were in the news but we didn't see those happening uh, you know um um everyone's talking about um, ai implementation but that needs money and india has those guys available at really high cost how do we implement that we're not getting the uh, kind of support for that so i think you kind of addressed a very important question thanks we asked for bringing that up because that really formed a very huge part and pavai is very entrepreneurial you know a lot of um, a lot of people who are you know professionals and entrepreneurs and it's a very relevant part that yes we can talk about green shoots and stuff but when you hear government talking about you know all the all the things that's happening and on those things are really changing by the day the execution is key here right i think palavi let me just reiterate the point uh, you raise a very sensitive point and maybe it's relevant for entrepreneurs who were on the show um the morat there was a scheme of moratorium which was there for 3 months from march to june which has lapsed the government has come up with moratorium 2 which will uh, finish off in the month of september there are discussions that morat to be extended till december but that's on paper it's yet not out but so to speak what is in vogue right now is the morat 2 scheme of government which is on right now so any entrepreneur uh, who has been current current as in has been servicing their emis or their obligations with within a uh, and has been a standard asset which means that they have not delayed by more than 60 days they have completely uh, in their right to go and seek such support of moratorium and i would believe that the banks are proactive uh, they should be supporting because most banks have a scheme called uh, opt in or opt out so what it naturally means that some banks have gone gratuitous that we are assuming that you have opted in and some may say no no i have enough cash i would like to opt out so they are opt out models and many banks have followed the process of opt out so i think going to the website of the banks and understanding this in first place or checking with your banker is going to be important moratorium is available i presume that is a very basic common knowledge that should be available there larger parts of question are that i want to invest more are there ai technologies and this and that and how do i get more lean digital and efficient i think these are the points when you move from survive to revive mode i think when you hit that uh, i guess there will be platforms where a lot of digital is on shared or a cloud platform 
and there are consultants who also are assisting so uh, that could be a separate forum altogether how ai enabled or rp or automation etc can be brought into businesses and how migrant laborer if they come back or don't come back so those could be a separate session altogether i don't want to kind of overwhelm people with such discussion but i know that there are very deep pains people have and it could be a separate discussion altogether on a platform like this we will do that yeah pallavi if i may just add because yes, riyaz, riyaz i'll take half a minute uh, riyaz mentioned about china i think what the the, the uh, china is the first country to have this virus and first country also to show some signs of what we would call a recovery i think what's very evident is that the manufacturing sector uh, recovers faster the services i think are taking a huge amount of time even in china to 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 come back so i think people will have even if they if it's a restaurant business for instance they'll have to take a pay cut and then uh, then work there because the people are still not thronging to those places for uh, so it's not business as usual so services are going to it's going to be a long winding road for the services sector in general whether it's airlines anything that has face to face contact thanks dk thanks we are i'm going to come to rachel with a very different question rachel i'm going to talk about uh, patrons and i'm going to talk about people who miss you and i'm sure you miss them just tell me how have you managed to stay connected to um, you know people who be missing going out to sakhi stone house of mandra and all of that and what have been some of your areas of things that you have dabbled in over the last 3 to 4 months so we are actually super lucky that we live in a digital era right where we can get in touch with people so easily whether it's been through zoom calls or social media or whatever but uh, um, you know like um, everybody has mentioned so far staying relevant is so important and it's not just a matter of sort of posting pictures of food but it's also that constant communication with customers whether it's about you know what measures you're taking to ensure that um food is being packaged made and delivered safely uh communicating things like you know you know probably order directly from us as opposed to you know through a swiggy or a zomato or whatever because we've got our own delivery riders so at least it's you know it's it's more in our control over here as opposed to going through an aggregator um you know getting in touch with people and just you know calling up your customers and just trying to ask you know how you doing or um i've actually noticed the number of people that have gotten in touch with us directly saying that you know we're missing this particular dish from sassy or we've got this chili oil from house of mandarin how do we use it so we we started posting recipes online um you know so people can start trying things at home You're giving away the recipe of the chili oil. Don't do that. I buy tons of. I'm not giving the recipe for chili oil. I'm telling people how they can use our chili oil to make things at home. But uh, yeah, you know, so people have been in touch uh, a lot, and it's interesting because I've been getting call uh, messages from people on my Instagram as well, saying, you know, I want to make this thing, and I'm trying out this recipe. I don't have this ingredient. What can I use? And before, honestly, I wouldn't really have the time to get involved into those sort of things. but now the engagement has just gone up uh, quite a lot so it's nice to sort of get to know your customer on a personal level and uh, you know and it's nice to see what they are missing as well not not just about like you know this is what we're doing this is our menu here you go uh, but the other what you know the feedback that comes from them we did a series called the lockdown heroes and we where we were celebrating our chefs our managers everybody who was sort of instrumental in uh, you know making sure our operations run smoothly and we kept on reiterating you know when once we open up next time you see these guys say hi say thank you because without them you know we'd be at a loss right now so it's it's interesting and um, at the same time i've been working on a lot of things over here in goa uh, i've been working on sustainable menus i've been working on immunity menus and trying out different things the other day i made a, a macaron with uh, with bindi actually it was very very good I did like a so I've been doing a lot of weird things over here and they're they're working out so I'm waiting to get back to the restaurant and actually you know start rolling out these menus. We've been inundated uh, for requests, uh, you know, by requests for you to come on board and show us more menus to make with children, more food to create. That's another thing, you know. We've been doing a lot of lives. I've been doing a lot of these like live demos and stuff. So so it's nice to suddenly do something different that you probably wouldn't be doing if things were normal. having said that i do wish things were normal oh absolutely but you know I, i'm speaking for pavai but for us our children are much more uh, restaurant uh, uh, you know they crave restaurants more than we do 
so the day times and all the cool restaurants would be the kiddie times you know the sunday brunches and the saturday mornings so i think we are all really looking forward to that and uh, what you guys are doing fantastically is keeping us engaged on your social media you're available to us you know i have to pick up the phone and ask you to do a live when you're there so i think um, that uh, that works uh, i know it's not nowhere close to keeping the business alive as such but i think uh, brands are longer they live longer than just businesses yeah, you know, i mean uh, riyas already pointed out that right now i mean all we can do is really delivery but none of us have invested so much to just operate a delivery model i mean we're here to provide an experience that doesn't sort of translate through delivery and right now we're just doing delivery we're doing these meal boxes dessert boxes diy kits and stuff just to sort of stay afloat but it's not a long term solution at all i can I, can i just come in about rachel saying that i find it very interesting about the delivery business and all the aggregators and i find that you know a crisis almost tailor made for uh, delivery aggregators such as uh, swiggy and zomato will actually now start lead to their very undoing in a sense because uh, you know the, the covid has been more responsible for digital transformation than ctos and uh, what rachel is actually developing her service creating her own online platform where people are going to order directly because uh, it's a matter of trust right i think people will no longer discover restaurants when we are blood spot this yahan se kuch naya try karte they will actually order from the restaurants that they trust and if you have your own digital uh you know ordering platform and you are able to stitch up your delivery very well then i find that it is quite interesting that um, the delivery aggregators will actually suffer the most because of this uh uh crisis of of covid and i agree i mean i'm going to just for a second jump over to that side as a marketer myself i agree with you as well i think trust as soma as well said you know trust has become a very important i don't mind paying 100 bucks extra so long as i know that my food is packed by you guys and delivered also delivered, delivered by the same delivered guy delivered by you guys I, i mean i know and of all those stories that lurk in your negative news stays in your mind right. and whatever said and done that the image of that man on the cycle opening up a box and in a time like this pops up in your head and that's what consumer recall is right yeah. so i, I think the uh, guys are doing the, doing the delivery themselves the same guy was bringing you food from the kitchen to your table is now bringing you food from the kitchen to your house and even the honesty and the transparency in mean, bombay canteen kind of came out that okay one of our guy is not well and we are closing down the kitchen so there is a lot more accountability and ownership right. when we are so deeply connected on a day to day basis with our instagram accounts or whatever so that i think that um that ownership accounts for a lot and that trust remain and i think that could be that one little um you know good thing coming out of this is the relationship between consumer facing businesses and the consumers deepens absolutely you know, i'm i'm hoping that's uh, i don't know for me that works as a little bit of a green shoot somewhere that i know that a lot will change and too much will kind of go through this entire manthan process but what comes out of it hopefully would be strong brands which have uh, stayed the course and of course bled by i mean mm-hmm. badly but hopefully stayed the course getting me to soma then with godrej soma my uh, i had a uh, had a question to ask you which was and you said you picked it up yourself the godrej was made at the time of a crisis um and you have been with godrej for i think around 17 yeah, years i am an right? adult i i said that officially last month i became an adult in godrej and yes. i know this how i can calculate myself because soma was my senior in b school as well so that's how my my maths will never fault me there So much. Tell me, uh, we keep hearing about terms like agility, resilience, for you know, for small players. But how has Godrej kept itself ahead of the curve on this, and and gently so? Because I know that um, you've been uh, you've been on papers and media all over as the you know as the star, shining star from Godrej. But how does it feel? Where is the emotion there, and how does the emotion translate into a big big company like that, staying the course across so many cycles? Just tell me about that. uh you know that's a very very interesting question because as they say i mean a basic example is that an elephant will take so much more time to move versus let's say a mouse over there who would like immediately and that's the difference when you come to a small business versus a very large size business and which is also dependent for the livelihood of so many employees and all the best part is that that challenge I mean, I don't know. In fact, even when we talk to our uh, stakeholders, in leaders, uh, Nisa, for that matter, the best part is the way we transformed was absolutely seamless. Starting, of course, 
first thing is when you started working from home which seemed like you know is it even possible because during the meetings you're not in front of that person uh, will it be as comfortable and that was like the smallest part of it the best part is the development of the new products that were required you know when we interacted with consumers and we reported to the top management that look guys you have to bring in x y z number of products in the market now the cycle for each product which used to be like one year one and a half years as to 60 days we actually have launched new brands new products within 40 days now if that's not agility i don't know what is agility i mean i'm sure you guys would have seen a lot of new brands which have been born in the recent times like entire range of godrej protect from the powder based hand wash which cut the hand, liquid hand wash price by one third to an entire range of uh, veggie washes etc all of that happened trust me in just 40 days now that's what you call agility in terms of understanding what consumers want in these times and as you know like rachel also just pointed out how do i remain relevant to my consumers if they are not able to have my food cooked by me can i enable them by you know the basic things like i i heard about the tanto about the whole chili oil right so <laughs> you know it's it's actually true for every organization now choice is for the organization to speed up things decide that i'll cut down all the bureaucratic lines make decisions very very flatted decide that you know this person will be responsible and those decisions were taken overnight literally but you will cut down these these processes and it will happen this fast processes at every level without of course as we said the trust of consumers is so important without compromising on the quality of the product we deliver ensuring that all the requirements let's say fda license etc all of that and that we not a time like this when you know getting licenses also is difficult we ensured all of that is done so you choose you know what are the processes you absolutely need that what are the processes you do not cut down the you know the basic flag discretionary and non discretionary absolutely So over there those are the choices we made and uh, yeah i mean hopefully in the next few uh, days we'll see our quarterly results and we'll be pleasantly hopefully for all of us we'll be very happy but then i mean jokes apart the thing is that it's about making choices at this point what is important to the consumers uh, what is important for us to convert the needs of the consumers and hence sticking to that cut the flab and just get to it but it has changed also which is not related to your question but something that again i heard about the whole um dynamics of how consumers are interacting since we were discussing logistics etc the one big change we are also seeing is that people are not willing to step out and go to the modern trade like the high code the kawaii high code etc the demand of kawaii etc would see a lot less footfalls and uh, yes my husband has been complaining a lot about it because he is uh, the head of uh, uh modern trade for our organization and he and his business has been suffering the jokes about what is happening is this is being rise to a lot of business on e-commerce now once consumer gets used to the convenience of e-commerce with having goods delivered at your home also the insecurity of transacting online people are getting used to that you know people were earlier very very worried about transacting online etc it started with cash on delivery and stuff but then more and more people are transacting online that's a behavior shift and with the digitization and everything you will see a new normal and beyond the point that will become the normal that will no longer be new so a lot of developments are happening in the consumer space so it is a very very active space we are in and we have to keep watching out for what exactly is happening it will define the distribution channels that we are into it will define the way the organizations have set up their distribution structure a lot of it will will go for a change even the kind of stock units you are keeping the kind of pricing the products a lot of these choices will be made now so my i can see that on a saturday you're buzzing with energy i am always buzzing with energy you have seen me two years 24 hours <laughs> <laughs> yeah um you know it's it's almost 90 minutes and i can go on and i'm sure you can go on but i think uh, we, uh, the the beauty of this panel has been that I had so many questions, but you guys have somehow answered all those and more. So I'm now going to go again around of closing remarks to all of you. And before that, a huge thanks, honestly, 
uh, this conversation has helped me tremendously. This conversation, I'm sure each of us has enjoyed the interaction and all the people who've been hearing. I mean, I know that we are not in easy times and like DK said uh, adequately, we don't know what recovery is going to look like. We don't know how it's going to come. But the one thing is honestly is there is that we can talk about it and we can kind of be around for each other and for what it means and, and hope that it somehow kind of really finds a solution somehow and we can move to whatever normal it is, new, latest, newest, uniquest, whichever. So anyways, I'm going to go back to DK and say, ask you to just give us, um, you know, um, as a macroeconomist, quick ones, uh, what do we watch out for? I know green shoots are falling off a cliff, you know, and no one's looking for green shoots. But what do we look, look out for now? And any words of quick advice to all the people for whom it matters? Well, I think number one, we should be looking out for whether government is going to give more fiscal stimulus or not. I think the second tranche should be coming anytime. And what is the focus of that? And I think that is very critical. So far, they have focused on vulnerable sections, distribution of food, etc. But the vulnerable businesses, I think that that uh, that should be the next focus. And that will give us some hope that the, the businesses will be able to uh, cross uh, the bridge will be strong enough to take the businesses to the other side. So that is number one. Other, I think what I've learned, I think uh, the economists are now also trying to learn the behavior. I think uh, the behavior, there's a new whole branch called behavioral economics. So uh, what, what typically happens is that we tend to extrapolate what we are observing, I mean, which is called the recency bias in, in, in projection. So consumer behavior is changing. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but not all of it will change permanently. That also I can tell you. I mean, some of people tend to revert back to their old habits. And I think once you have virus under control, you will see many of the old habits come back. I mean, so some of the things will be transitory. Some will be permanent in consumption behavior. I think being able to figure out what is transitory and what is what is permanent, I think is going to uh, be uh, uh, will differentiate between somebody who's going to win and somebody who's not going to win. Thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, Manish. I think anyone who's heard today has, and who's an entrepreneur has benefited a hell lot because you've you've really covered so much ground, and I think definitely one. Uh, conversation with you with a lot of questions and an open panel of people asking their questions and kind of you know um, open mic would be I think next in line but what are your uh, um, words of advice to entrepreneurs out there since you cover a whole lot of ground um, yeah just your top tips the, um, I can say that we segregate uh, this is our perspective as bankers financiers uh, customers in four categories, uh, winners, strong survivors, weak survivors, and losers. So very quite quickly, uh, at the end of this pandemic and whenever it tapers off or whenever, uh, even if it doesn't taper off, it becomes a way of living, uh, what will happen is the, the last two categories will get marginalized and there will be vacuous space and a gray space for the first to dominate. So uh, to those on, the, on this side of the barbell strategy, I think they would certainly benefit a lot. My only uh, realization is that in the last 120 days or so, um, a lot of uh, the social outgoing has actually been silenced and to deafening self-silences. And then people have become comfortable within their own selves. Um, and typically to disrupt any pattern or form any new habit, uh, there are various numbers, but some of them mention it takes 55 days. I think we are well more more than four months into a lockdown and there is no sight if it's going to be like this for another three months or four months. So which means a lot of long-term habit formations have already happened. And as DK mentioned, some of them probably will be hard-coded and some of them could be reversible changes depending on what kind of stimulus uh, these habits get. So decoding the minds of your consumers and understanding what changes are of permanence and what changes are ephemeral, I think that's going to be key. And perhaps that will differentiate between a winner and a strong survivor. So these are my parting lines. Thank you, Manish. Riaz, we'll come to you. Um, I have a tough one for you as always. Your words of advice and encouragement to the people who look to you as an entrepreneur. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to thank you very much for putting together such a great panel. I've learned so much from Mr. Joshi, from Mr. Jaiswal, Rachel, and Soma. Uh, I wish uh, 
I could have called my entire uh, brethren and my fraternity of restauranters to uh, to learn from consumer insights from Soma and from Anitri and Joshi ji. Um, uh, you know how how to get funding for a restaurant, and maybe I can uh, bother you all later for a separate session for a community of restauranters. Uh, my advice uh, is anyway, it's not my my advice, uh, but I will uh, say that um, um, I think conserving cash is is very important. Uh, that's the most important thing. You just try and conserve cash. Uh, just wait for conditions to become favorable. If uh, uh, Try and reason with your landlords. And Maniji said this before also. Try and reason with your landlords. Uh, there's a lot of blood coming and try and try and conserve value for a favorable condition. I, I know there's this urge that you should be doing this and that, but um, really there's, there's not so much you can do unless you can get into FMCG and get into essentials very quickly. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. There's this, this need to pivot it sits so heavily on you. I think right now it's just a question of survival. And then stop, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, mental health issues comes with, you know, uh, anguish. And we need to be doing something. We need to be doing something. We need to find ways of being relevant. Uh, if our skill set is to, and you know, to lubricate social interactions, and we just have to uh, wait uh, and, and also pray that uh, social interaction will come back and we will not become uh, solitary creatures and... Uh, uh, our social brain will kick in very quickly and uh... I'm sure it will. The optimist, you know, I just heard Simon Sinek's um, little piece yesterday on optimism. That optimism is not positivity. It's not like, ha, sab hai, sab hai. optimism is that, okay, fine, you know what, we are in shit, this too will pass. And I think, um, yeah, we just there for each other. And I think, yes, you're right. It is what it is. Um, hang in there. Hang in there. So, looking forward to see you in social and Rachel, your words of your, your, your message to provide. Firstly, I have to say that I've just learned product placement on another level from Riyaz a number of times he said social. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what happens when you squat on a generic name. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. See, we always learn from Riyaz. Riyaz is everybody's godfather in this industry. But no, as far as, uh, you know, advice for people, I think the main thing is don't be disheartened. This too shall pass. And I think use this time wisely, um, try and look for different revenue streams, tweak your business model, you know, uh, creativity and innovation is often a byproduct of adversity. So sort of use this time wisely. Fantastic. You, you bang on. Thank you. Short and sweet. <laughs> um, well, you're, you're someone who makes desserts, so you have to be sweet, right? And I'm short as well. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> so Ma? Uh, the the happy the happier FMCG person closing the day for us. Your uh, your hello and your your words of uh, your last words. So I, as I started, I think in the beginning itself, I said that every crisis really is the mother of an opportunity, and it's for us to take it. And just uh, because I heard Riyaz talking about hope that people become social and again plugging in social over here. Uh, there is something that I read about, I think somewhere around May, I read about this in China, that the moment things opened over there, I think around May, I read it, there was something called revenge consumption that happened because people were in lockdown, they were locked inside. So the moment the things opened up, people just went wild, they went to the salons, they went to the malls, and they went to the restaurants, etc. While in the current context, obviously, it's definitely not advisable, etc. But, but human beings being social, I'm sure they will throng out and Hopefully, with some precaution, with, with uh, things continuing in terms of products that are there, sanitizers, etc., with all those precautions, but the social thread of the human nature will not change. And hopefully, we'll all be back to back to the happier phase. And yes, all the best to all of us. And uh, yeah, I mean, finally, for the economy to survive, it's not just a happy FMCG person who can talk about it, because... Even we won't sustain if the basic economy is not in place. So for all of us to survive, we need the entire community to be there. So my message is just stay positive and this too shall pass. So thank you so much. And really, thank you for all the learnings. First of all, Pallavi, thank you so much. I mean, really enjoyed learning so much from all the panelists. And thanks a lot for your perspective. And yeah, thanks to wish you all the best. You and hope you all soon meet up at the Sassy and the Social Super Soon. Uh, Absolutely. Now looking forward to showing. 
all right guys thank you so much thanks to everyone for tuning in we're going to sign up everybody. now bye bye thanks everybody thanks everybody bye -bye. Bye -bye. Okay. nice to meet all of you thank you same, same here, here. really nice Enjoy. to meet all of you